sailing class, a number of broken bones converged, and she focused on home ownership instead. But a collection of pins, plates, and other horse themed trinkets remained. Edith was a voracious reader from the time she was a little kid. In her 30s and 40s, she read science fiction and fantasy books. In her later years, she read mysteries and romances. She loved Nora Roberts and read every one of her books, and loved her weekend stay in Roberts Inn in Boonesboro, Maryland. The Kindle was the best invention ever for Edith, as she could borrow e-books from the library and make the print as big as she needed. In her spare time, she would read four or five books a week. This included all the Harry Potter books, periodically mandating midnight excursions to a local bookstore to get the latest release. Edith was a clothes horse in her 20s and 30s on Wall Street. As a stockbroker, she could afford to go to the boutique shop for fine quality and custom fit. She had left behind her earlier life when her grandmother bought her material to make her own dresses and her Texas housewife look, opting for the dress for success skirted suits of the 1970s and 1980s. Edith never met a stranger. She would engage with just about anyone about any topic. She was interested in people, which probably made her such a good stockbroker and later a successful antique dealer. Edith loved to bake, and folks would attend now meetings just to indulge in her brownies. She delighted in wine tours, which were a requisite part of most vacations in the past two decades. She acquired a taste for chocolate martinis at the annual NARAL Evening of Chocolates events. Edith was a great cook, probably due to her Southern legacy. She was always looking for something new to try. In the past decade, Edith became a foodie. With several excursions to Philadelphia or Frostburg just to enjoy the new taste. Trips to Paris, Italy, and Ireland were embraced in part because of the cuisine. Scotland, not so much. She loved being a grandma. She loved the concept. She loved visiting the grandbaby Danny. She had planned to buy a place in Quebec province to be a bigger part of his life after retirement. <coughs> Edith's favorite way to travel was by train. When she was a kid, her parents would move and would put her on the train from D.C. and she would be collected by her grandparents at the nearest station and driven to their home in London, Kentucky, where she would stay for the summer. When she lived in New York City, she would take the train Friday night to visit her mother, and who was working as a government secretary, returning Sunday evening. In her later years, Edith loved to take excursion trains, especially old steam engines, traveling to Strasburg, Pennsylvania, Cumberland, Maryland, the Grand Canyon, Romney, West Virginia, to see the eagles on the route. The most recent train trip was an overnight adventure from Chicago to D.C. in a sleeper car. She collected glass perfume bottles, mostly miniatures, some rare, French or Italian, some decorative, and some relatively plain. A favorite prize in any antique shop was a perfume bottle she didn't currently own, two treasure troves for the flea market in Paris, and the Gettysburg City annual garden sale. Edith loved growing things. She had her partner convinced that gardening was easy, rising early on the spring weekends to greet the day and dig in the dirt. For three years, they watched the flowers emerge and flourish, seemingly effortlessly. Then Linda started helping with the gardens and realized that the preparation part of the gardening was hard work. Edith highlighted the triumph of rebirth, not the pains of weeding out and clearing a place for the miracles to happen. She made it look so easy.
I'm Jill Mahoney, and Linda's sister. I first heard about Edith during a phone call from my sister Linda. Linda had moved here to attend law school, and we talked regularly on the phone. During one call, Linda told me she met someone and was moving in with her. I could tell by the way that she spoke of her that Edith was a special person. I didn't meet Edith until a few years after that call when Linda and Edith came to Phoenix to visit. When I met her in person, I knew what Linda saw in Edith. She had a warm, infectious smile, had a great sense of humor, was kind and intelligent. As we all know, Edith stood up for what she thought was right, volunteering for animal rescue organizations and various equal rights causes, and working diligently to get politicians in office that she felt could make a difference. The legacy on the political scene that Edith had, has had will live on forever. I have a couple of memories of Edith that I would like to share. One is for her love of the desert. When Linda and Edith came to stay with us on that first visit to Phoenix, Edith fell in love with, a, with the landscaping of a house down the street. The house was the one house in our neighborhood that had de desert landscaping. Gravelly sand for a yard, lots of overgrown desert bushes and cactus. <coughs> I came home from work the first day that they were at our house to have Edith tell me how she loved that yard. I personally didn't see the beauty in that yard. I loved the green grass and the trees found in places other than Phoenix that Edith loved the desert landscape. The other memory that I'll share with you was last Thanksgiving. Linda and Edith came to visit, and within a day, I'll get it together, within a day of their arrival, Edith was coughing up blood. She ended up in the hospital, and I spelled Linda well. Linda went to get a few hours sleep, so I had the opportunity to sit and talk with Edith. And what she told me were things like how she and Linda had met, which I hadn't heard before. She talked to me about her grandmother and how her grandmother was a rebel, which David shared with you. And that's who she attributed her spunk to. And she told me about her life. The hospital was not where Edith wanted to be. And even though that's probably where she should have stayed the whole trip, she convinced the doctors, let her go, because that was Edith. And she came and she had Thanksgiving dinner with us. And, you know, in spite of the fact that Edith was just struggling to breathe, every time she walked, it was a struggle. She was coming to Thanksgiving dinner and she was going to a movie the following day. And you know, nothing was gonna, nothing was gonna keep her down. And we all know that's Edith. That was Edith. Edith's death has left a huge hole in Linda's life. As Linda said to me the other day, they knew it was coming, but they were in denial. Linda has lost her soulmate, the love of her life, her support system and her partner in political change. Being in Maryland this trip without seeing Edith's smile and experiencing her warmth and kindness makes me very sad. I will miss her tremendously, and I know a lot of you will also. At this time, if anyone has some thoughts or memories about Edith that they'd like to come up, and share, I would invite you to do that. I'm Chris Van Hollen, friend to Edith and Linda. And when I think about 
our friend Edith, I think about that wonderful smile that was so beautifully captured in the photos that we saw. And when I see that photo and look at the smile, I also remember her wonderful laughter and the warm and very gentle greeting that she always gave to each of us and to her kindness and to that ability she had to connect with anybody she might sit down next to. And I also think about how that kind and joyful demeanor was fueled with a passion and fierce determination to fight for the principles that she held dear. Edith's journey is the story of the triumph of persistence over adversity, as we saw through her life story here. She left in an early, she left in an early abusive relationship in Texas for a new life in New York, where she joined the Brooklyn chapter of now and became politically active, something, of course, that stayed with her for her entire life. And she fought not only for women's rights, but for equal rights and equal justice for all people. I remember talking to her on many occasions, and she believed to her core in the exhortation from Dr. Martin Luther King that injustice everywhere is injustice, excuse me, injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere, and she fought it. And it wasn't just a belief she held. She understood, along with Linda and so many people gathered here, that it's not enough to hold those beliefs. You have to roll up your sleeves, and you have to get in the trenches, and you have to work at it, and you have to be willing to enter the political fray, and that she did. She did here in Maryland through her positions with Montgomery County now, her leadership positions, in state now with so many people who are gathered uh, in this room and fought those battles together both in Annapolis and uh, in the United States Congress. She worked tirelessly to elect the candidates and we saw so many photos who's, who, who are indebted uh, to Edith for being there for them in order to advance the causes that she and all of us in this room Hold dear. And even as her health worsened, even as she was hurting, uh, she continued to make those phone calls for political campaigns. And even when she couldn't go door to door herself, she would drive other volunteers who went off door to door, determined to the end. So I think we all know that Edith relished those political battles. But we also know that her greatest love, her greatest love was Linda. Through all the ups and downs, Linda was her greatest source of joy, her strength, her inspiration. It was and it remains an amazing partnership. Linda, we know how much you're going to miss Edith. Our hearts are with you and we want you to know that we will join you in honoring Edith's legacy by continuing to work with you, continue to work with you to advance the causes to which you and Edith have dedicated your lives so beautifully together. spirit that she was in life and the legacy, legacy that she leaves in those of us that she inspired. And she was a great intellect, as you said, David, but she was also an amazing doer. 
She was always making things work in the background. She never sought the spotlight, but was always doing the work to give voice to others. People who have no voice in the greater context of their lives often need great leaders to show them the way. <laughs> and that amazing team, that amazing team of Linda and Edith was doing just that. I know that those of you who know me might find this a little bit um, surprising, but when I was considering whether or not to run for public office, I, I wasn't sure I could do it. Um, I was hesitant. I was not confident. But between the two of them, between Edith and Linda, they convinced me, not only that I was up to the challenges, but that I was needed to, to, to seek that in order to help others, other people <coughs> recognize their potential, and especially young women, to recognize their own voices and where, um, where they will go. All right. You'll notice that Edith never ran for political office. And I think that perhaps that was because her strength was her ability to bring out the strength in others. Well, the efforts for equality and equity have suffered a, a blow with the loss of Edith. She, as, as the senator did say, leaves a tremendous legacy especially in Maryland's Legislative District 19. Um, I think, you know, both Marise and I attribute our being where we are today to, um, to Edith and Linda. So I was looking for a, a pithy quote that might capture Edith. I can honestly tell you I didn't find the perfect one. But, but one that did strike me was some was one by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Um, and she said that the happiest people I have known have been those who gave themselves no concern about their own souls, but did their utmost to mitigate the misery of others. And if that is true, then I believe that Edith was happy and that she can rejoice in the life that she led, giving so much to others. And I know that I am personally so grateful for the chance to have known her and looking, for, and looking forward to carrying on her legacy and being a friend to Linda. Thank you. tag team thing here. Uh, Bonnie Grabenhofer and this is my spouse, Gabriel. Uh, and we we moved to DC a little more than eight years ago um, to to work at the Now office and um, and continue the Now worker from Illinois. And Edith and Linda welcomed us. You know it's hard to move to a new place and you wonder, you know, Who's going to be my friend? Who's going to go to dinner? Wow, I don't know if I can do this. Okay. <laughs> and Linda and Edith welcomed us into their home and into their lives and, and made us feel like we belonged. Um, you know, when I picture Edith, I picture her making food and sharing it and, and making their home welcome. I, I picture her at the barbecue grill, putting some chicken on and or some burgers and, uh, and having a house full of, of people and introducing us to, to her friends. And probably the, the, my, one of my favorite memories is we went back to, to one of, one of her, her and our favorite places for for dinner, we went to Mike's Crab House uh, on the Chesapeake Bay. She loved crab, and um, very patiently, so patiently, 
showed us how to crack it open and take that hammer. It's a huge, huge pile of crab on the table with, with uh, the paper tablecloth and bang the poor little crab and, and fight with it to get the little piece of crab meat out of all this pile of shell, pile of high with all the bay spices. And, her, and talking about how she used to, to have crab with her, her dad and, and her joy of a pile of crab. It was, it was Edith's joy and I just love that and I love picturing, picturing Edith with her big pile of crab and the big pile of crab shell and, and just having so much fun. <laughs> but I, but <laughs> Yeah. Um, many of us are very, very lucky in life to have huge families. Linda, you're very lucky. Some of us, and many of us, we have families we're given and families we make. And Edith and Linda are part of my family. You will forever be. She was a good sister, as are you. And we will have your back, and we will be your sisters forever. Thank you. Thank you. We are so proud to do the, the political work with Linda and Edith and to be able to call them our friends and our family. Thank you. My name is Beth Corbett, and I'm the uh, interim president of Maryland now, sadly. And I just want to share with you that uh, ten, about 10 years ago, I think, we met. And I met Linda and Edith at another meeting. They had moved in, into the area and started coming to the meetings. And I could tell right away, this was a force to be reckoned with. And the now people in the room, I think, will appreciate this, and that now isn't always the most welcoming to new people when you first walk into the room. I think that's probably true of a lot of organizations. But I can tell just by looking at them and seeing how dynamic a relationship that they had and have, and Linda, you were so fortunate to really have found the love of your life that I could see that this would be a power couple that we needed to latch on to. And I had sort of taken the helm of Marilyn now at the time because we were in a difficult transitional period. But I had my own challenges at home with my sister moving in with me and I knew I couldn't do it forever. And so I approached Linda and I said, I really want you to run and be president of Marilyn now. And thank God she did. And not only did Linda become the president, but we got Edith too, which was a fabulous bonus. Because we had Edith's brownies at every meeting. I know I came to the meetings sometimes just for the brownies. Because I'd be having a tough day and I'd think, well, you know, I'm not sure I want to go to the meeting, but there'll be brownies, so I'm going. And both of them are and were just so full of love. And they were so willing to open their arms and their hearts and do whatever needed to be done in the state. And I still revel at the amount of energy Edith had, even when she was suffering with so much pain. She was still able to get up and go and do more than I could ever do. And I just cherish and value that I got to know this wonderful woman and spend some time with her. And I love you too dearly. Thank you. I, I 
again, I'm Jennifer Jones, and I speak to you now um, as friend, as family, and in my official role as chair of the Commission for Women in Prince George's County. I remember conversations with Edith about working together and staying together. When I had the joy and pleasure of meeting Linda and Edith, that joy was underscored by the most open embrace that a young woman with a big heart and a great passion could have. When we tried to advocate and help women to learn how to be more politically engaged, run for political office, Linda would sit down and be the person, so appropriate was the song, When Beneath My Wings. She would always be the one in the forefront that everyone knew. But I remember my first conversation, long conversation with Edith, and she talked to me about being strong and always continuing the fight, and how the most important thing was to show up. And so I want to share and say to Linda today that we honor and appreciate you and Edith for always showing up. My husband, Chris, just lost his father and said, make sure you tell Linda the only reason that I'm not here is because I don't know if I'm strong enough. He said to me one day, many years ago, I was having a low moment in leadership. And when I got in the car, Chris said, I talked to Linda and Edith about you. And he said, and I want you to know no matter what challenges you face, when Linda and Edith show up in the room, they are saying to you, keep going. Don't stop. We got your back. We're here with you. He said, and how great are these two women to thank me for supporting you? I love you, but I want you to always know when you're in the room with Linda and Edith, you have friends who love you. And so with that, Linda, I want you to embrace that not only do you have my heart and my love and commitment, but when you call us, we'll be there. That starts with Chris and I in family love and friendship love, but I extend it for all the sister friends who wrote me and told me to send love from the We Three Committee, send love from the Commission, send love from Prince George's. We want you to know that when you call, we'll be there. Not just because of your wisdom, not just because of strategy, not just because of audaciousness, but because you and Edith were always there. Your love and genuine and authentic embrace her always being there is what we value most. We love you and we'll be here with you. We can't feel the loss, but we can do our part to walk with you. Thank you. Okay, my name is Gilda Yarlsey, and uh, Edith was my friend. The last time I saw Edith was on um, December 2nd. We went to a Linda, Edith, and myself. They took me to a holiday party here in Maryland somewhere. And since I'm not local to the area, and I expressed the desire that it'd be nice to have some kind of holiday experience, uh, the union party. And it was, a, it was a lovely evening because it was out of the traditional, you know, Christmas joyous season, but they still had a whole mixture of um, holiday gaiety. And we were chanting, singing, and at that time, I knew that Edith wasn't feeling that well, but that evening she was really alive. And we just had a great time listening to the music 
enjoying the festivities and visiting the people. I wanted to share that. The other time that um, I spent time with Edith was maybe two or three weeks before that. We went to brunch um, somewhere else, since I don't know anything about this area. But, uh, we went to this great place, what was the name of it? Tower Oak Lodge, and it was um, Clients, okay, clients, and it was a very welcoming place. It was uh, like a hunting lodge. We had a great brunch, and I remember, you know, watching the video up here and her desire to be a grandmother. Well, on the drive up there, it took a while to get there, and Edith was chit-chatting about how she grew up in Kentucky. But it didn't dawn on me until I heard from her family members and close friends of her beginnings um, from Kentucky that it clicked in my brain sitting there listening uh, to what she was explaining to me about how she grew up and what some of her experiences were. So I appreciate the fact that everybody shared that with me because that just made me this existence a little bit more precious to me. And during that ride, I also had this, um, this feeling of, you know, she connects really well with me. And, you know, we had a deep, friendly connection because she can connect like a grandmother. And she can just tell me the story. You know, I kind of felt like a, um, a child when I would say to her, well, why? 